My name is Penny Cook, and I'm the president and CEO of Pioneer Network, and I want to welcome you all to the latest edition of Pioneer Network's Listen, Learn, Explore podcast. This series features experts in person-directed care and culture change and explores timely topics. Each program in the series consists of two parts. The first, which you're joining us for now, is a short podcast. This will be the opportunity to listen and learn. The podcast will be followed by an interactive discussion hosted on the Zoom meeting platform on March 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Designed as a variation on a learning circle, participants will have an opportunity for continued learning, but more importantly, to explore the topic and engage in a takeaway activity. Now, let's get started. I'm pleased to introduce our topic for episode three of Listen, Learn, Explore, Urinary Incontinence. No, we're not kidding. Let's talk about it with our speaker, Dr. Rosemary Laird. Dr. Laird is a board certified geriatrician who knows that collaboration and communication are critical to managing intricate issues of aging. She graduated from the Georgetown University School of Medicine and she completed her advanced fellowship in geriatrics at the University of Kansas. Before we start, I want to acknowledge CENI, part of the TZMO group. The SENI mission is to improve the lives of people that live with incontinence and the lives of the caregivers by providing premium quality products. Management of urinary incontinence is most effective with a person-centered and multifaceted approach to care. And for over 60 years, the TZMO group has been manufacturing premium quality medical and personal care products that help people all over the world enjoy life without worry. I'm proud to have SENI as a member of the Pioneer Partner Network our corporate partnership program, and they're also sponsoring this podcast. Dr. Laird, welcome to Listen, Learn, Explore. Thanks, Penny. It's great to be here. Now, Pioneer Network is all about promoting culture change and person-centered care. Tell me how urinary incontinence fits in to what we do. Yeah, it's hard to imagine urinary incontinence fitting in anywhere, right? No one wants anything to do with urinary incontinence, but I really do, I do think it fits into that. And, and sort of here's the way I think about it. Um, for a long time, um, those of us who are in the long-term care senior living space, if people uh, had urinary incontinence for a very long time, the one thing that we would uh, need to do thinking about their care plan is what size adult diapers did they need? I mean, that was really about as much thought that went into it. We assumed it was going to happen. So we looked in the cabinet, hmm, small, medium, large, and there you go. That was the solution to this really distressing problem that people don't even want to talk about, let alone you know, discuss with someone what are the ways that maybe we can help manage this. But guess what? There's a lot of ways you can help management manage it. And it's not supposed to be something that happens to everyone as we get older. So, you know, we, I really believe, and um, I, I thank you for also believing that we've got to move on from that one size fits all approach and that person-centered care, that's so important. That's what everyone deserves. That's what we'd all want for our loved ones and ourselves. And I really think senior living is a great place for this conversation to really start because after all, we know we're helping people live their lives. We're not just providing them a beautiful lobby or a efficient apartment to live in. We're really helping them with their lives. And unfortunately, as we get older, certain things happen to our bodies. And this is one of them that can happen. But if it does, it needs some attention and it needs some compassionate care, some smart care, someone who is able to help us think through what are the possibilities for helping this individual with this problem? That person-centered approach to it is really what I think can, can turn it around for a lot of people and make what is a really distressing problem not as much of a, of a real threat to their quality of life. And that's why I love that we're talking about this and why we titled it the way we did, because I really think that this conversation is meant to help normalize incontinence because it is something that some people experience. And that brings me to my next question and you kind of hit on it. So from what you said, incontinence is not inevitable as we grow older, correct? That is completely correct. I know a lot of people think it is, and if you took 
a group of say a hundred people who are in their eighties and nineties. Yes, about 50, 60, maybe even 70% of them would be experiencing urinary incontinence. But you know, one plus one doesn't equal two here. It isn't necessarily just because they're 80 or 90. It's a variety of other factors. And sometimes those factors are actually things we can change. Can't change that you're 80 or 90, but there's a lot of other things that go into it. And that's where it really can pay to, to know about that symptom and to be able to help someone about it. So I get so concerned that because of the stigma, people won't even tell me. Um, in my medical uh, training, as I learned about urinary incontinence, I found out it was a, it was a don't tell and don't ask type of situation, which in this particular case means patients don't tell, but doctors don't ask. So you can see right there that it's just going to be allowed to happen um, because there isn't an openness. And the threat to people's quality of life is just huge. I've, I've had patients tell me, you know, they've stopped going to their bridge foursome because they, it's too embarrassing to get up from the table so many times. Or goodness knows, no one wants to have a, an odor about them. Um, and if even a little dribble, um, people get concerned about that. So clearly there's the reality that people um, in this particular symptom, it leads to people isolating themselves, self-isolating. And I've even had patients kind of say to me, you know, I knew my body was going to change. I was like ready for it, right? You know, we put on our cheaters. We say, okay, that's okay. Um, I can deal with that. We may begrudgingly put a hearing aid in our uh, ear, but certain things like picking up a cane to walk with or admitting some urinary incontinence, those are like across the line of the taboo. And it just, no one really wants to admit that. And uh, so we're back to our don't ask, don't tell um, situation. And then, you know, the problem that we have, which is large numbers of people having a symptom that's devastating that hardly anyone wants to talk about. And yet there's things we can do for these individuals. So there's our, there's our issue. And that's the message we want to get out there. And that's why I think it's so cool that you've recently written this white paper in partnership with Sunny about aging and urinary continence, incontinence. And so why did you think this was necessary? It, do you think it was because, you know, there's this don't tell, don't ask approach to things? I mean, a white paper on urinary incontinence and especially the partnership that, that we have too, that's kind of unusual. So what was the why behind the white paper? Yeah, well, I think the why um, from, a, from a CENI standpoint had to do with a similar sentiment to mine, and that's why when we put ourselves together, uh, it made for a good synergy. And that is this idea that the reality of this symptom, not being something that's inevitable, that you have to tolerate, um, it, that understanding really needed to be brought out of the dark and people's awareness needed to be raised. And in addition to that, and this is where the company comes into play, um, when I was with patients talking with them, I have to agree that say, at the beginning of my career 30 years ago, there maybe wasn't really much more than small, medium, large, and one or two brands, on, and they weren't really on the shelf and found very easily. So I'm, I'm not blaming anyone who has that idea in their minds, but Part of the reason for awareness raising in this case is also raising awareness that the world of the products available for people to help manage and live with and have quality of life with this symptom uh, is, is a whole, it's a whole different world. So we've moved so far beyond the small, medium, large. There's qualities of these products that are really important uh, to help individuals. But that's the key, help individuals. Um, the products are so advanced now that it's important to know why someone's having incontinence. What type of incontinence are they having? What are the symptoms? When are the symptoms? And you know, do they have the right kind of um, product that they're wearing for the type of trouble they're having? 
And so we've, we're used to just letting the symptom go. And among the medical community, I, I'm, I'm not putting them uh, up as, as being ahead of the curve on this. No, no. Um, it, it's, it's also something that's accepted there as a, well, it's, it's bothersome, yes, but we got bigger fish to fry if the blood pressure is high or you know, someone has some other uh, condition. Uh, so we tend to sweep it under the rug there too. So uh, the white paper primarily had at, at its origin this awareness raising. Uh, the second thing I think from my perspective was that I, I wanted to kind of decomplicate uh, some of the assessment of this because especially with my um, my beloved geriatric patients, you know, the, I call them the 65 and betters. Um, the, the medicine, the figuring out their care needs is, is a lot more complicated. <laughs> and sometimes things that are too complicated, we just kind of throw up our hands if we don't have enough time or we don't really know what we need to know. And we, we all have been in the situation where once you kind of have a framework for something, all the complexity can kind of wash away and you can figure things out. Well, the white paper was really intended to help kind of clarify some of the complex aspects and allow people to say, well, look, this isn't so hard, <laughs> you know? And then if you take that complexity away, you can actually do the holy grail of this whole um, endeavor. And that was really start to elevate the conversation so that it's about one patient. So much of care in the past, especially in our larger congregate settings, larger group settings in, in senior living, so much of the care has been focused in some ways appropriately on what does the group need? Who are the likely people that will live here? What is the, the sort of likely need of the people who will live here? And that's good. And there's a lot of benefit from that. But one of the things I think that leaves out is the individual medical and clinical, like what is their individual need? And in this particular symptom, we've, we've sort of laid the groundwork for why um, patient-centered, person-centered care is so important. Um, you can do so much better. And so another sort of theme throughout the white paper is that we want to um, help you have an awareness dismiss the complexity because we're going to give you some kind of shortcuts to think about it in a very crystal clear way. And then all of that is going to allow you to have the time to make sure you're doing it in a, in a person-centered way. And I think that that's going to ultimately, you know, move the needle a little bit, at least we're hoping. Well, I think so too. And what I loved about the white paper when I read it is that it is so practical. It taught me so much and in very practical terms. And just so everyone knows, at our virtual learning circle on March 18th, we'll be sharing the white paper with everyone. So you'll have the opportunity to download it and read it as well. And we'll be delving deeper into it. But the other thing you said was about getting to know each person. And that is one of the first values of Pioneer Network is knowing a person deeply. And we always had the belief that in order to help people engage with life the way they want to engage with life, in order to offer them meaning and purpose, in order to create home for them in senior living communities, we need to know each person as individuals. But you bring up such an interesting point that I think goes by the wayside is with incontinence care and some other clinical care as well, we do still have this attitude about a one-size-fits-all approach that we're trying to break away from. Not saying everybody does, we're stereotyping, but you know, we, we do overall. Um, so I find that so interesting. And one of the things you talk about in the white paper too, is it's not just about helping to support people when they have the symptom of incontinence, but maintaining or redeveloping continence as well. And if you could speak a little bit about that, because that's the other thing is that sometimes I think we kind of give up on people when they develop incontinence and we think, okay, well, that's it. But that's not always the case, right? Oh, no. Yeah, that's the, that's, there's a lot in that question, Penny. I'm going to have to really sort of, oh, I'm going to have to take that one apart a little bit. But yeah, it's a great question. So, 
I want to, I think I'm going to jump in sort of on something that came up on the tail end of your question. And that is um, one of the things I've found um, really refreshing about working with the CENI um, folks is we were working on this um, idea of having some easy way to help people uh, keep in mind what you need to remember about product selection. And so, you know, they're a product company, right? But no, they informed me, no, they're actually a company working to help people have quality of life if they have medical symptoms. So it's actually a much bigger company and this is one of them. But the first, the first sort of uh, idea out of the get-go from them was that we needed to remind people that if you're choosing a product for someone, and now this is especially true for us clinical people, but if you're recommending someone go get some um, briefs or underwear or pads, be sure you've already thought of how you can reduce their urinary incontinence or, or make sure you know if there's some treatable aspect of it. And I just loved that because I thought that's really what this disorder deserves. Um, and people with this disorder deserve for someone to look at it and say, wait a minute, it's not normal aging. So if it starts happening, we need to know why. And we don't just go grab the pad, we figure out why, and then we start helping them live with it. Because unfortunately for some of us um, in our 80s, 90s, some percentage of the urinary incontinence might not be able to be managed and eliminated with medicines and a variety of other uh, techniques and things we can do to try to help keep someone from having any incontinence. But I really liked that approach to choosing products and that is choose how to need the least product. You know, I, I really thought that was, that was good. But going back to um, what you talked about, um, with respect to like, how do we approach it? I think I've kind of just uh, sort of started with this idea of when it first starts happening, you know? So number one, I hope what we're doing today is going to help so that when it first starts happening, people aren't afraid to tell. And there's more of an openness for doctors to inquire. So we start telling and we start asking and we allow that the people who are being asked about it also have a higher level of knowledge of how, that they do need to help someone and how they can help them. So I think that's the first thing. And for, uh, for any listener to know that it's not normal, it needs to be evaluated. There's something that's gone wrong. Um, and that's sort of step one for the new kind of onset of urinary incontinence. And then if we're thinking about someone who says like, I, I actually have ladies will come in and they'll tell me uh, uh, a, a symptom and will uncover that there's also incontinence, as we're working on that, let's say we've gone through our evaluation and we've kind of figured out that we can get, say, 80% of their incontinence taken away, but we've still got 20%. Well, as we move forward, our care plan is going to say, well, what do we need to do to keep that 80%? And the answer really is you usually need to do a few key things. From the standpoint of urinary incontinence, number one, sort of factor in our bodies, if you will, is how strong we are. Now, I know you're probably thinking, well, strong bladder, can the bladder be strong? Actually, yes. And so that's a little more probably detail than anyone wants to know on a podcast. But yes, there's ways to make not the bladder per se, but the muscles that support the bladder. There's ways to make that stronger. And your general physical strength is a bit of a marker, if you will, for the strength of all those muscles that are involved in helping your bladder. So uh, me as a doctor, I'm looking for what somebody's general strength and do we need to have them on a physical activity uh, regimen that's gonna help increase their general strength because that's gonna help them maintain their continence. And the second thing might surprise you, but it has to, to do with what we eat and drink. Uh, there's, we could do a whole podcast on the issues of eating and drinking as you get older. Um, the body changes, a lot changes as far as how the rhythms of your days go. But with respect to your body and urinary incontinence, the amount you drink of water and the amount you eat of fiber 
has a lot, they have a lot to do with each other and they have a lot to do with keeping both the gastrointestinal system going and our urologic um, system going. And not many people sort of understand those connections, but that's another sort of thing that we do in the white paper is we kind of bring out these aspects of the care of the older person um, in thinking about, well, how do we approach older people's care? And one little tip is that with older people, it's usually not one answer. You usually are looking for five or so. And then your solutions for older people, if you, if you're, if you didn't get one answer and you're, I mean, excuse me, if you didn't get one uh, cause, you can't have just one answer. So if you've got five causes of, of some problem or five contributors to that problem, you better have five solutions up your sleeve or you're really not going to make as big of a difference. But Again, maintaining continence often has to do with maintaining your physical strength and eating and drinking properly. So that's sometimes a surprise to people, but those are really the two keys. And then of course, if there's another medical reason behind the 20% is the example I was using, we couldn't remove 20% of her incontinence, understanding the medical aspect of why and making sure you've had a thorough evaluation and been given a, a a good medical care plan for that part of it is really critical. And we've already said that doesn't happen as often as it should, but let's start making um, that happen. So now I think you mentioned too, like let's say somebody um, had been doing okay, but they got sick. Uh, maybe they had to go to the hospital. Sometimes people have to have catheters for a little while if you're really sick and you wanna kind of regroup and sort of get better. Um, and regain your continence. Well, you're gonna do the same things. You're gonna, that's why physical therapy and getting up and about after surgery is so important. No one talks about it, but part of the reason is, is you want to be able to regain that general strength because now you know that general strength can be also part of the strength of keeping um, urinary incontinence at bay. And as well, think about what happens when you don't feel well for whatever reason or you're in the hospital or just some kind of illness, you're eating, you're drinking, those, so whatever your routine is, that's gone to the wayside. So getting back to that routine usually helps. And then of course, whatever the reason for the incontinence, figuring out you know, what you need to attend to to that. Um, but I really like the fact that you're asking about that and not letting people get away with well, once it starts, we can't go back and fix it. No, oh, it drives me crazy. Yeah, especially, I just tell, I just go crazy if someone says, well, they came back from the hospital, they've got a catheter. Okay, I guess that's what that's gonna be from now on. I go berserk. No, that, that, there's nothing about that that make, well, there could be a medical reason for it, but very rarely. Usually it's that um, they need some rehab. They need to get back in their normal dietary routine. Um, but mostly they need some rehab to get back to their general physical routine. And often that is, is exactly what they need. But again, you know, maybe a little sensitive, but those special exercises that um, people know as the Kegel exercises, they sometimes get, there's sort of a, a very unfortunate sort of belief that those can't work. Um, I don't know what it is about the age 65, but many people just believe that elders, that that's not worth even trying. And it's so untrue, and I'll just be here to myth bust right now. Um, there's plenty of research evidence that shows that that's still a possibility for seniors um, to be able to both do them and benefit from them. So it's absolutely um, still part of the care of anyone who's trying to maintain or improve their um, uh, pelvic floor muscles so that they that doesn't um, play part of play a role in their incontinence. What I love about what you're saying is that just because people are of a certain age, just because they have gotten out of the hospital with a catheter, just because they are having incontinence doesn't mean we need to jump to, okay, they need a brief and that's it. And that's going to be the rest of their life. They're going to need the catheter for the remainder of their life. All of those things. I think sometimes we jump 
to these conclusions. And the other thing is about Kegels. I mean, that's that's fascinating. I didn't know that there was a belief system out there that says, for instance, they don't necessarily work for people of a certain age. And we're all about combating that negative perception of aging. So I almost, when you said that, I thought, oh, well, that's kind of ageist. Um, of course it is, but yeah, that's everywhere. Yeah. That's what's, that's what's out there. But then I also, there was so much to unpack in what you said. And one of the things that I thought about was that, you know, I have never necessarily thought about the strengthening of someone's overall um, muscles to, that that would help, you know, with strengthening the muscles around the bladder. It makes so much sense, but I think we compartmentalize things so much. And so breaking down the silos of care like that and looking at people as whole beings and realizing that what they're putting into their bodies is having an effect on their continence or incontinence at times. And, you know, the development of muscles and maintaining muscle strength affects that too. So there's so much here. And when I think about senior living communities, when I think about nursing homes in particular, there's so much to learn from this, obviously. And, you know, in my mind, it explains so much of sometimes why people who move into nursing homes, we know sometimes, we've probably all seen it, that they're walking, a, a distance at home when they move into a nursing home. And just because of these systems that we have in place in nursing homes, sometimes the dining room though is too far. So we start using a wheelchair and sometimes it becomes easier to use a wheelchair. So the person begins walking less. The person then loses muscle tone. Like one thing we can see leads to another and I can see how that could slowly lead possibly to, you know, a person having some symptoms of incontinence as well. Yeah. Oh, that's a, that cascade of frailty is, is all too familiar for many of us. Um, the other time that that can strike is after a hospital stay, you'll take a perfectly functional individual who has a hospital stay. And I forget the statistic, but there's a quite high statistic or excuse me, quite high rate of individuals who don't leave the hospital at the same functional level they came in at. And the higher your age and the more your um, health conditions, the higher uh, percentage of, of decline that you have in your overall functional ability. And we also know that some people just never recover that. Um, from those kinds of events. And it has nothing to do with, uh, you know, the original reason for the hospital stay, you know, that wasn't uh, enough to really do it, but it's the culmination of limiting the mobility and limiting the nutritional intake. And that's often the combination of things that is able to really take an older body uh, and uh, accelerate its aging is sometimes how I put it. So, it yeah. And I, I really think too, from a clinical standpoint, um, and, and this is and, and this is true, I think, across the board, we all get trained um, in these silos. So we, we're going to learn about high blood pressure, or we're going to learn, even me, learning about geriatrics and 60-year-olds and 70-year-olds and that sort of thing. And so everything we do is, is really focused in on these sort of um, sort of group characterizations. And we group people together, and then they have these you know, protocols for how to handle, you know, people with high blood pressure, people with urinary incontinence. Well, the fact of the matter is, you know, just like we all like to say a big study that took 30,000 people has a result. And a lot of people like to say, well, but my one patient isn't like the 30,000. Well, I always say, well, then people who have urinary incontinence, this is how we do it. No, you have one her son who has urinary incontinence, do what they need. Uh, yes, you wanna be informed by science. So don't anyone say, Dr. Laird said to ignore the research. No, I did it, but you get my point. You, you, you also have to have contextualization of it, right? You've got, and that's what everyone's life, everyone's individualness and our lives are our context. And so that's where I try to really promote the idea of, don't even look at the age first, but know their, their health status. Um, that's really where you can start sort of understanding some of these issues um, about these kinds of syndromes. I love that you said, don't look at their age first, 
but look at their health situation. That just, yeah, that resonates with me so much. So thank you for sharing that. Now, we've talked a lot about a person's physical care who's having symptoms of incontinence, but their psychosocial and mental health is so affected as well. And you mentioned that earlier, whether we're talking about participating in groups, going to the dining room, or just getting a good night's sleep. So what can we do to ensure in senior living that we're addressing the psychosocial impact of incontinence? Yeah, that's a really good question. And it, 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 it really was driven home to me by a patient once who said, I was talking to her about her urinary, urinary incontinence and she's a very accomplished woman. Um, now I believe maybe in her eighties and, and a, a variety of medical problems. And she, she looked at me and she said, you know, I, I did okay when my uh, eyes started changing. And this kind of goes to what I said earlier about the cheaters and stuff. She was sort of in that camp. I did okay with that. I did okay when my ears, you know, failed, but um, the real reason I was seeing her was because her memory was starting to fail. And so she even said, she goes, I'll even live with this mild Alzheimer's you say I have, but I'll be darned. The one thing that I just feel so abandoned and defeated by my own body is the urinary incontinence. She just, that symptom, after all she'd been through, that symptom just like sucked the, the her out of her, you know, it just was soul, soul defeating. And that really struck me because you wouldn't have looked at this lady and known her to be anything but, a, you know, a stand up gal that wasn't going to be taken down by anything, but urinary incontinence took her down. And for the reasons we, we sort of alluded to with my bridge playing gal who won't go to see her friends anymore, you know, that loss and that isolation, I certainly think there's been some really important conversation about that, of course, in the post 2020 COVID year that we've just um, survived. And some people are still in the midst of some deep isolation on that from that reason. Urinary incontinence can do the same. It can really plunge people into that isolation. And from an older adult standpoint, one of the statistics that I've just kept in my mind from my training was they looked once in New York City at a bunch of different um, individuals to look for overall mortality rates. And even when you control for different health conditions, people who live alone have a higher mortality rate um, age for, you know, even if you're looking at the same age and same condition, heart condition, uh, functional status, all of that. If you control for all of that and you're alone, you have a higher rate of morbid, of, of mortality. You're going to die sooner than someone who's got a socially connected life, family, friends, etc. You know, let that sink in. So people don't want to go out because they're you know, afraid of odor or they're afraid of appearing, you know, old and all the stigma that goes along with urinary incontinence for sure. And that's taking, you know, precious time off their valuable life. Um, that's, that's pretty powerful. So that's, you know, I think um, a big blow to mental health, um, let alone the potential that it's going to erode other aspects of their life too because everything I was seeing that lady for, especially her memory, that was not gonna be helped if she couldn't be active, couldn't go exercise anymore. If she couldn't you know, keep her mind active, she wasn't a bridge player, but whatever she was gonna do as far as being socially interactive, that was gonna help her brain too. So you start to see, talk about a cascade of frailty, you, know, you start to see that um, in very real ways play out when people are more isolated. And urinary incontinence will definitely do that. So I think opening up the conversation around it and also elevating the awareness in the senior living community to have an eye out for it. You know, why isn't Mrs. Jones, who's always at bingo, you know, or, or never misses dinner, you know, why is she now asking for her tray? You know, it's getting someone to, have on their radar that that's one of the things to just be watching for. 
So I think that's an important aspect of taking our care and senior living to another level um, that includes some of these really key clinical uh, clinical pieces. Uh, so that would be my hope is that that's kind of where we're headed with all of this. That would be my hope too. And it was interesting in your example, one of the things that made me think of as we're talking about knowing people deeply is your patient who had other issues as well. And you might think, you know, any of us might think, well, maybe it was her cognitive issues that would be bothering her more or maybe, but you know, everybody's different. And for, for her, it sounds like the issue of the incontinence was, you know, her primary focus that she cared about. And I think it's, again, so important to involve patients and residents in knowing what's most important for them, knowing what they want to tackle, what they want you as a physician to assist them with and help them with. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And, um, you know, you, you definitely learn that lesson sitting across from patients. And I, I want to encourage everyone in the senior living space to, you know, do what you can to allow for that individualization. And, you know, the, yes, there's a lot that you can do for the large group, you know, whatever size community you're involved with, but, but see what you can do about allowing for that individual personhood to um, come forward. And uh, first of all, you'll be better off for it. So, um, you know, I'm always fascinated when I hear patient stories and then humbled a lot. You know, just this morning I was on with some patients and learned about a brother helping his sister and she had had, had, had a, a tremendously difficult life. And I saw the brother and he too was physically disabled and turned out his circumstances were just as, as sort of horrific and dire as hers. And yet he's her caregiver now um, because that's the way the fates kind of, you know, played the hand that uh, he's helping her. And so, you know, you just, you just don't know the person in front of you until you inquire. And I think people deserve to have that inquiry, you know, happen. And then we're going to be that better, they're much better able to address some of these sensitive clinical issues too, because that's another challenge in a non-personal, you know, living setting um, where everyone around you isn't your family. Um, there's that sort of, you know, challenge to overcome um, with uh, a professional kind of setting. But I really believe with some um, smart education and conversation around all of this that we can all figure out ways to train people to be, you know, empathetic and to be careful in how they talk to people, but also to be smarter in how they are observing people and to, you know, really, you know, just have some of these issues in their bag of awareness and then at the right moment in the correct way. So it's to not offend or bot, you know, upset, you're able to broach these sensitive subjects. And I, I think we're all going to be the better for it. Um, but we have, have a little bit of work to do. Um, most patients, I'd say, want to be involved. Um, we brought up the aspect of cognitive impairment, and that really is kind of its own thing. Um, depending on the level of cognitive impairment, you may have someone who's unable to participate in any conversation about their care. Um, and to me, that's one reason why patient-centered or person-centered care is so important because I have spent my whole career primarily where working with people with um, uh, all the different kinds of dementia, Alzheimer's disease and all of them. And, and especially because that's what I've done, I've tried to be very mindful of the fact that everyone is still a person who deserves individualized care. And it can get really difficult when that person can't give you their own symptoms <laughs> to not provide them personalized, person-centered care. And yet, if we educate ourselves properly and train ourselves to be good observers and to think through the, uh, you know, the conditions we're dealing with, you, you can still actually be very honorable to that idea of person-centered care, as you should be, um, but especially for the person with cognitive impairment who's like fully, wholly dependent on us and very vulnerable to, you know, being only able to get the care that they can get from the people around them. Um, so 
I do usually, and the white paper does include some references to cognitive impairment because its prevalence is so huge. You really, I don't think, should leave it out of any conversation about, especially in senior living, uh, every senior living you know, operation needs to have special attentive care um, for the patients with um, cognitive impairment. Um, because they can't participate, we're that much more responsible, I think, to uh, align with them and be their advocates for their care. Um, so that's how, kind of how I feel about the cognitively impaired people. The individuals who do want to be involved, I love that. I, and that's why I really, you know, the paper's written in order to make more people on the professional side, you know, more aware that, yes, we need to be the other, we need to be as good a partner as we can be to people who would, if given the opportunity, want to be involved with that and say, yes, I want some help in that, you know, and what can we do? Excellent point about partnership with patients and residents. I, I love the use of that word. So we need to wrap up pretty soon, but I have one more question. And it's something that in my family, we've been dealing with some incontinence issues um, for one of my family members. And I know there's a hesitancy, whether people are living at home or in senior living and care communities to purchase less expensive products. <laughs> and, you know, I'll say that just again from, from my own family experience, but I think it happens in senior living communities as well. So how can we encourage people? How can we encourage nursing homes? How can we encourage people to pay for quality? Oh, that's so interesting. Well, I've actually dealt with that in my family too. So, um, yes, it is very hard to judge the value and to work through that question of, if I pay more, am I getting more? But what I wanna recommend goes back to what we said a little bit earlier, and that is there's been a sea change in the world of incontinence products just in general. And the availability of the types of products has really, um, the, excuse me, the, the quality of the types of products available has really improved so much so that I really want to encourage individuals or certainly um, anyone who's in charge of the senior living environment to be sure that you've talked recently with the suppliers of product and really take some time and have one or even two different suppliers come in and talk to you about what their offerings currently are. And from a, a medical standpoint, now, you know, some of our family members are lay people, obviously. So some of this, you know, some of it works and some of it doesn't. But from a medical standpoint, the, there's really two main sort of problems with poor quality product or product that is going to get too wet too fast. <laughs> I mean, the problems are really two big ones. The first one is your skin. Our skin doesn't wanna be wet, it wants to be dry. And there's any number of problems that can start with out having dryness in our skin, especially in that very sensitive area. And so the sort of downstream effect of that is significant. Um, and, and I certainly have had many conversations. Oh, I'm fine. Oh, I'm fine. That won't happen to me, da, 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 da. But it happens <laughs> and it can be a problem. The second thing is, and this is also a thing that most people can't imagine happening to them, but it happens over and over, is if you're using products that aren't quite able to keep it all in, then sometimes there's the feeling that, well, I've got a product on, but I still need to get to the bathroom. And that hustle to the bathroom turns into a fall. And that fall turns into a much more problematic, you know, health event than even the incontinence was in the first place. And so those two things, let alone the problem of infection, now, if there's one area that I have had some traction from a standpoint of my personal patients is many people understand infection and they don't want one. And so when I am at the 
sort of bottom line, I've got to get somebody convinced that they need to use do something different. Avoiding infection, that's just my little tip, tends to be the one that they seem to, that seems to resonate with people a little bit more. So that's one thing I'd say, but between you and me, it's the infection, but it's also the skin breakdown and the risk of falls. Those are all huge. And if you're using a product that doesn't contain the fluid that you need it to contain, you're at risk for all three of those. Some people, my family included, will do the old trick of a pad of a brief plus a pad, plus two pads. <laughs> None of that works. What you need to be doing is talking with the product developers and understanding the different absorbency levels. There's also these days different levels of types of materials that are on top and, and um, reaching, touching the skin. So as far as what type of material makes contact with the skin, that becomes very important too. Those are all things that are important. There now are night and day products. So did you know? So there's some for night and some for day. That's why knowing when someone's incontinent is so important. So all those things, there's also actually, before I move on, there are certain products for certain body types and genders. So men, women, people who are a little larger, you know, there are certain products that can be more effective with certain body types. And whether you're someone who spends most of their day sitting and lying, or if you're someone who's up and about, that mobility question has a lot to do with it. So get someone to come and talk to you and help you understand the different products available. In my practice, um, also having a company that will give you some samples can be really helpful because people can go through a lot of different brands and trying different things before they can find the right um, fit. So uh, most of the larger companies will help you with samples. So that's another thing um, to think about. And especially at the facility level, I hope um, you'll talk to the different companies and um, ask them to, you know, help you get some familiarity with their product. Um, so I think the main message is um, it, you'll know the value when you start seeing um, your residents happier and you've got to, you know, look for those kinds of products that can reduce the number of complications that you have and the number of times you have unhappy, you know, residents. Um, your product numbers will probably decrease if you have the right kind of product that doesn't have to get thrown away excessively because it wasn't the right product to begin with. Um, so there's those kinds of, you know, economic factors too that I think play a role. And so the companies are, are very good these days at helping you um, factor that in uh, as well. Well, it seems like as in, is the case in so many things in life, that if sometimes we concentrate on the front end of something, and even if maybe we pay a little bit more on the front end, we actually get better results later on. So whether it's decreased infection, whether it's that resident who does now is now able to go to the dining room and play bridge and all of those sorts of things, there are those positive results otherwise and possibly a decrease in cost because of you know, not spending as much, getting rid of products that you know, are not usable for people. So yeah, that- that it, alone yeah, I'm sorry to talk over you, Penny, but let alone the personal sort of feeling of, you know, avoiding the humility of, you know, what's happening or the humiliation of what's happening. Uh, laundry, <laughs> you know, I've had people tell me they have to throw out a favorite chair. Isn't that sad? Um, but, you know, those things happen and that's all can be related to this whole issue. But at the end of the day, if you've got the incontinence, it's due to what you're using to try to help you know, contain and um, reduce the, the problem. So yeah, the product really does matter. And we said earlier, one of the reasons for the paper is to raise awareness that product, it's not just one size fits all anymore. Even the way you measure someone for the product is important and, and not well known. So you've really got to be careful. You can't just look at their waistband and say, oh, I'm set. You know, you really have to um, be sure you know how to measure someone to get them the right kind of fit. 
Um, Cause we all want to be comfortable there too. You know, imagine we all know how uncomfortable that can be if you don't have the right sort of garments on. So it's, it's a big, it's a big part of keeping people, um, you know, keeping their dignity, keeping them feeling comfortable, keeping them feeling like they can participate in life and keeping the quality of life high. It's what we'd all want for everyone else. And certainly our loved ones and ourselves when, you know, we're in those, that eight, that uh, phase of life. I almost said age. Did you see, did you hear me? Well, you changed it. I, 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 I did. I'm not switch in your mind. Okay, good. I caught myself. Whew. <laughs> well, you know, I almost feel like we're back to where we started. And after this conversation that everyone has had with us for the last 45 minutes, um, I hope that now we got back to that question of why is Pioneer Network talking about incontinence? And it, it is because this is such a, a topic that resonates as for the need for being person centered. You know, it just, it, it so resonates. Everything we've talked about has gotten back to, we need to know the individual person. We need to know the individual resident. So Dr. Laird, thank you so much for your wealth of knowledge, the practical information on the topic of urinary incontinence. And for all of you, we hope you've enjoyed the podcast and we invite you to join us as we continue to explore this topic in the second part of the Listen, Learn, Explore program, an interactive learning circle style event, which will be held on March 18th at 1 p.m. Eastern time. Many thanks to our sponsor, Xeni, who will be joining Dr. Laird and I on the 18th as we explore this topic more deeply. To learn more and register, go to the events page on our website, pioneernetwork.net, or to the Pioneer Network Facebook, LinkedIn, or Twitter pages. Thank you and have a great day.